tuning in to the US Paralympic swim, Swimming Development Session, Growing the Future of Para Swimming. First of all, I just want to thank Bob Woodruff Foundation uh, for their support of the conference. We would like to also just bring you this virtual opportunity um, and just thank everybody on the call from US, the United States Olympic and Paralympic um, uh, Training Center and the folks over at Para Swimming for their time. For those who missed any previous sessions, uh, recordings um, can be found on the conference webpage, and this will be the same web page that you use to RSVP for the session. Before I turn over the show to our speakers today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute to minimize distractions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions uh, rather than the chat function. You can use the chat function though to introduce yourselves to each other and just make sure you send your chat message to all panelists and attendees and introduce yourself that way. So without further ado, I'd like to thank our presenters for today. We're welcoming Erin Popovich, Nathan Manley and Peggy Ewald, who are all dedicated to the growth of para swimming and representing the USOPC in various capacities. So thank you all for joining us and I'd like to turn things over to Peggy today. So thank you Move United for having us today. Um, it's our hope that you take away um, an increased awareness of what U.S. Paralympic swimming has been doing to uh, develop our grassroots efforts and bring more para swimmers into the program. I'm a consultant for U.S. Paralympics um, on this initiative, and we rolled out um, those initiatives in, beginning in 2017. So the vision was to improve the numbers um, that progressed at each level, each stage through the pipeline from our developmental foundational levels all the way up to our national team. The primary goal was to increase introductory knowledge of US Paralympic swimming and to help, I guess, grow the knowledge to all stakeholders about what U.S. Paralympic swimming had to offer. Next slide, please. So what we expect to deliver to you today, what we want you to take away from this presentation is just some key distinctions of U.S. Paralympic swimming, uh, some of the initiatives that have been primary in growing our pipeline of para swimmers, just a layman's um, classification outlook, the para swimmer development progression, competition progression that goes along with that athlete development, and then some basic technical considerations for coaching and training a para swimmer with a physical, visual, or intellectual disability. And then we want to give you what the next steps might be for you as you look at progressing up that pipeline. So let's um, move on. Next slide. So those key distinctions of US Paralympic swimming will look like this. Next slide. US United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, which is now known as the USOPC, which was a major stepping stone for all of us and a, and a great, um, historical event. The sport of swimming has two major divisions under that. We have an Olympic division, which the national governing body, known as the NGD, is USA Swimming, and they serve all swimmers um, with or without a disability. The Paralympic division, which our NGB is US Paralympic Swimming, serves disabled athletes with an eligible disability known as an EI. Next slide. The primary functions of our NGB in growing our, our grassroots development and helping progress our athletes is to help facilitate sport development through education and partnerships. We want to assist through these partnerships not only coaches, but athletes as they go through the development progressions. And mainly that happens through talent identification, meaning from the grassroots where we find these para athletes 
and move them up into the pipeline and through the national team. We do this through camps and clinics, and then we do it by supporting them through competitions as well. So this is a camp um, where we were able to, to tag it on to uh, a pair of meat. Um, so some of those initiatives are gonna happen through meats. So between 2017 and 2020, it, this is done through a vast number of educational offerings and through a lot of resource connection and just trying to create relationships with any swimming body that has access to athletes that swim and specifically for us um, disabled athletes. Education through these camps and clinics then, you know, start at the foundational development camps. Those are also including Can-Am and emerging level camps. And the big addition that we added in 2017 and have continued are called intro clinics for short. It's just an introduction to US Paralympic swimming. We added coaches workshop only clinics and we're doing various presentations at organized swimming and coaches conventions and, and workshops. We've also created some webinars and some, some additional postings on our website to help educate and basically teach what US Paralympic has to offer. So at the foundational Can-Am and emerging development level, typically our foundational and Can-Am clinics and offerings, they are four year. Our past locations have included Ohio, Georgia, California, New York. Um, the emerging level have taken place typically at a pair of open series meet and those past locations have been Colorado and Arizona. So the goal is to increase the number of those camps. However, largely that relies on resources being available through a budget. So let's move on. So what an introduction clinic or what we refer to in short is an intro clinic. These are described basically as an introduction to US Paralympics the classification process, the sport classes, what to expect, how to, to learn more about US Paralympics. These are free clinics offered to attend. We have been conducting anywhere up to six regionally through the US. Uh, they are comprised of a two hour classroom session and a two hour pool session. Um, typically, they're through an organized swimming club who also supports us that day and provides volunteers and swimmers who can get in the water from their team to help with the, the athletes who are in attendance. The typical attendance includes disabled swimmers, not necessarily classified, disabled swimmers of any age, coaches of those swimmers, and parents of those swimmers. So we have sections designed in that classroom part that will specifically answer key components for not just the swimmers, but also the coaches and the parents. So these clinics are designed basically to increase um, and provide insight into Paralympic swimming, the whole movement, answer their questions, provide an opportunity for the athlete to have exposure to a national coach and other swimmers who are potentially even on our national team and get some one-on-one -on -one in the pool suggestions. Um, and then that gives us an opportunity to take a look at them and suggest uh, where they might be in the progression of moving up the pipeline and what, what they might need to do next. Next slide. The coaches only workshops were basically designed as the next phase of development. And they came on the page a little bit sooner because of the success of the intro clinics. Um, I conducted two of these last year as kind of like a test market for us. 
And the response was so successful that this year we had planned six of those and we put them back to back with our intro clinics so that every introduction clinic to US Paralympics also had a classroom session designed after that to delve a little deeper into the coaching aspect and answer coaching only type questions. It was a classroom um, presentation. A lot of it was training through video and demonstration and examples. So it was more of a interactive classroom session and it used a lot of video out of um, different clinics and different camps with our national team and other development um, foundational clinics and camps instructional materials. So it became very successful and we had these all planned for, for 2020. Ultimately, the goal was to um, trigger an increased confidence level in coaches of para-athletes so that they could impact the performance of the disabled swimmer quicker and it helped to lower the learning curve that coaches might feel when they're presented with a disabled athlete um, on their deck. So we were hoping to instill in them that they already have a toolbox. We just needed to add to that and, and they could help help their disabled swimmer just as effectively as they could their, their other swimmers. So another effort that we instituted, next slide, has been presentations at conventions and the production of some webinars. So this is a listing overall that was created and has been conducted in order to increase all the different swimming bodies that may have a, a para-athlete in their program or can impact the experience of a para-athlete already in their program or increase the, the knowledge level of all swimming arenas as to what Paralympics has to offer. So in 2017, presentations were done at all these different um, swimming organizations. Again, trying to target coaches who may be presented with a para-athlete in their program and, and not quite have all the answers of how they're gonna move that swimmer along. So I did all of those in 2017. In 2018, we continued that effort and continued to grow um, the webinars and participation as part of the World Para Swimming Educators course. I was one of three countries, the US was one of three countries to develop a full educators course. Um, so we were really honored that we had that opportunity to participate in that. And those, those educator courses are being done all around the world. In 2019, we had slated, um, again, the College Coaches Association convention. Uh, we were doing an officials briefing at the National Disability Championships, uh, coaches clinic with the Singapore Sport Program group that was done specifically for Singapore Sport Program. Um, Florida Southern College, I've done presentations to their exercise physiology department and their wellness program. And that, that was a great experience. We were exposed to 150 faculty members and staff in their, in their exercise physi physiology um, program. Um, again, just trying to spread the word about what US Paralympics really has to offer. And then of course, the educators course um, that was, I was a part of in Lima this past year. So all of these collectively um, the goal is to help facilitate an increase in knowledge and general awareness of what U.S. Paralympics has to offer disabled swimmers. So the footprint of all of these initiatives from 2017 that we have been tracking are the introduction clinics. Um, you can see that each year the attendance at these clinics continues to increase the coaches clinics in just two presentations as test markets, we brought in 38 coaches. Um, and then the newly classified athletes that we've been tracking, not necessarily all tied to these clinics, 
but you can see that the number of classified athletes as we go out into these swimming arenas is pulling in more and more pair swimmers into the pipeline. So this all leads to an increased national team footprint that is really remarkable. If you can, if you can follow along with me, I'll try to explain how this is, is working. This tracking shows the increase in high performance level para swimming. These numbers represent the number of standards that athletes are making in any given year. In 2016, which is the games year, the number of athletes in the programs is usually high. And typically you'll have more cuts being made, more standards being made during a, a games year or a lead up year. So the E stands for emerging. That is the first level that we start tracking standards with athletes. And then we progress from emerging level up to national C, national B, and national A. So these are the number of standards that have been met in each of these given years, prepping us in 2019 with basically the highest level of standards being met in preparation for a games year. And as we bring in athletes and we support them and develop them and move them up the pipeline, you can see that the numbers continue to progress on up. In 2020, of course, you know, our numbers are through one meet, well, one and a half meet, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron qualified it, basically one and a half meet of participation to set standards. And obviously in a, in a games year, there were two qualifiers for trials, um, standards being met to develop our, our team going into Tokyo. So everything is kind of short in 2020 because of the situation at hand. But you can clearly see that as we ramped up, um, we, and staring straight at Tokyo Games coming up in the summer, we were at a significantly higher level of standards being met by para swimmers than we were going into 2016. So the intended outcome is happening. Um, as we find fair athletes, we develop them through the system, we are seeing the outcome of more time standards being met preparing us better to represent on the world stage in a, in a higher level performance. Next slide. So one of the biggest areas of interest that always comes up when you talk about a Paralympic sport is the classification system. So we're not gonna delve too far into that, but I want you to have a general understanding of how that plays. So let's review a few basics of it. So the International Paralympic Committee, as everyone knows, as the IPC, for swimming, that function is done through the world para swimming. So WPS will be referred to. The main goals of any classification system for any sport is to determine if an athlete is eligible, group those para swimmers with that eligible impairment based on their activity limitations. It provides a sport class status. It provides rules that apply to that sport class because they are different according to the sport class. And then it provides a structure and competition. And it is geared to ensure sporting excellence at each sport class. From there, we can kind of ask, what is the classification system for paraswimming? It's a process of functional classification by World Paraswimming based on your maximum ability, the, the classification requirement um, is there in order for an athlete to participate in a Paralympic meet. You must be classified to participate as an athlete in a Paralympic meet. There are two different classifications, national and international. And the three different classification, um, three main sections or groupings are physical impairments, visual impairments, and intellectual impairments. 
and they're referred to by these initials at the end of each of those. So what happens at the end of a classification process is that the athlete is assigned a sport class. And for swimming, we have three main assignments within it by the stroke. So an athlete is given an S, an SB, or an, and an SM classification assignment. So for example, an athlete could be assigned in the strokes of freestyle, backstroke, and butterfly as an S9. They could be classified in their breaststroke, which is an SB. They could actually be classed down because their ability in that stroke is less because of their impairment. And then we have the individual medley, which is an SM signification. Maybe they go back up to, to a nine in that. So every athlete will be assigned according to their abilities in each of those strokes. And I, I, I think it gets a little confusing for some people when the, when the athlete doesn't have across the board the same classification, but know that their classification will give them three sport class assignments and they'll compete in those events according to that sport class assignment. So the next area that became a part of our initiatives um, in 2017 was to determine how an athlete is going to progress up our pipeline, basically setting to paper a, a progression, a pathway of performance progression. That is outlined for each level of how a pair swimmer can move from one step or one level to the next, all the way up to what our hope is, is to be on, um, on the world stage. So let's take a look at what that progression of the pipeline is. So you can see at the top of this, these are our levels of progression. Then it's by classification, whether or not they have classification at that level or what is needed at that level, the type of program that they might be participating in at that time at that level and then the type of competition that they would be participating in at that level. So the foundational level is where we bring them in. We do not require classification at that point. Most athletes aren't classified or they're looking for national classification. They can be swimming in any aquatic program. Competitions, maybe they're not competing at all. Maybe they're competing at a local or summer league level. Then we move them into a Can-Am level. They generally have national classification at this point. They are in a competitive program, hopefully, and they are competing locally, regionally, and hopefully into a para swimming specific meet. Then we move into where we actually start tracking. And at the emerging level, we start to track them. It doesn't mean that they are given additional support services outside of potentially a camp or an email by US Paralympic staff, but this is where we start to really look at how are we gonna move them. They're serious about swimming usually by the time they get here and they are competing. Um, they have national classification and maybe seeking international. They're in a competitive program. They're going to regular meets um, and they are, are definitely moving towards those, those national standards and they're taking a look at those. At the national sea level, uh, this is where they have national and international classification. They're in competitive programs and swimming year round. Uh, they're swimming anywhere from local meets with their club to international meets with US Paralympics. National B then, again, we're moving just a little bit higher up. The standards are getting faster. And then on to the national level, which is typically our games potential athletes. Maybe they've been to a games already, um, but they're looking to continue to stay at the highest elite level of performance. 
So that's the progression that athletes can become familiar with and how you would move up to what we consider um, a high performance level if that fits the athlete. Next slide. So another um, part of competition progression at each of these levels is something we need to look at next. So para-specific competition progression can begin at the foundation level competitions. These may be 25 yard pools. Typically there are no standards to enter them. Um, national classification may be provided at these meets, um, just depending on how that is set up for the year um, through the US Paralympic Swimming um, Division. Emerging competitions typically take place 25 yard or 50 meter pools at this point. There are typically no standards again to get into this meet, but national classification is um, almost always provided at these competitions. Then we go on to the national or regional events. These are in 50 meter pools. National and Can-Am standards typically need to be met for the entry into these meets, which means there's a minimum qualifying standard to get into the meet. Qualifier competitions then, this is where um, entry into the meet is going to be done through your NGB, which for us is US Paralympic Swimming. They are international um, potential meets. They're in 50 meter pools. Um, the World Series meets are at this level. Uh, there are MQSs required for those meets. Uh, World Championships is also an international meet where MQSs are required. Same with Para Pan Am Games. Um, there is a selection process to get on these teams and there is a trials meet for these, these meets. Um, World Championships and Para Pan Am Championships. We had one trial meet and both of those meets, um, we split out the teams for World Championships and Para Pan Am Games this past year. And the last qualifier competition is the Paralympic Games. It conducted in a 50 meter pool. There are MQSs. This is a selection competition. Um, it's a trials. Uh, required meet first and international classification is required to, to participate. There is no classification that is done at a games meet any longer. So another area that comes up when we talk about progressing uh, up the pipeline is the coaching and training ad adaptations that are required or need to be looked at a little bit deeper um, to move a Paralympic athlete on. So that in and of itself could be an entire presentation that can encompass days of presentation, but we're going to narrow it down to just a couple things that I feel are key. Um, so we're going to, we're going to focus on what is the same for moving a, an athlete all the way up we're gonna look at biomechanical development stroke models. We're gonna look at physiological training development models. And we're gonna look at what are the expectations of those athletes. And this is the same whether you're coaching uh, an athlete with a disability or, or one without a disability. Those are the same basic models that we're going to use um, when we're looking at training uh, and, and technical aspects of, of swimming. So what are the, the adaptation considerations when training a para-athlete? The biomechanical focus is gonna be on what does that athlete have? and What do you need to adjust in order to help them? The physiological training then again is apply what they can do and adjust it. So depending on their sport class, Depending on that particular athlete, you may make adjustments, but you're going to start from the same foundational model of training development. 
The expectations, again, you start from the basic that you would have for any athlete, and then you would expect their best and adjust to what is their best. So this is not rocket science. This is something that we feel most coaches already have in their foundation of skill sets. And all they need to do is make the adjustments to those same concepts according to that swimmer. And that's not anything different than we as a coach would be doing for any of our athletes. Is you adjust to that individual athlete as best you can with what they are able to do. So it's not something that you don't already possess as a coach. And it's not something that takes a, a completely different perspective. It just takes having an open mind and being able to go back to trial and error with that particular athlete to figure out what needs to be done to make them their best and to help them be the best potential pair swimmer that they can be. So what's next when we look at moving athletes up our pipeline or what's next for some of you watching today? The, the movement up the progressions of para swimming look like this. Next slide. We want you to become a member of an organized swimming club. That's the easiest way to have access to pools, practice, and professional coaching experience and knowledge. We want you to attend practice regularly um, for your ability level. Again, adjusting to what your sport class and your individual abilities um, can do. We suggest that you attend local meets to gain a more competitive swimming experience. Attend an intro clinic for a more in-depth view into US Paralympic swimming than what you're getting today. Encourage your coaches to attend that workshop that is designed specifically for coaches to learn specific adaptations that we have learned in the sport classes to be most effective um, in, in building their toolbox to uh, service their athletes best. Register for a national classification um, at the closest pair specific meet offering to gain national classification. Connect with other para swimmers, coaches, and parents to learn um, and just have a community connection to other para specific um, athletes and, and community. Learn to stay up to date on the US Paralympic Swimming website. That website has an enormous amount of information that you can self educate and keep yourself abreast of changes as things move forward. Become familiar with the national athlete progressions and the standards that need to be met at, at each level in each meet. And then the last thing is just be realistic in your expectations of progress. Swimming is a very, um, a very in-depth sport and each stroke is a, is a sport, so to speak, in and of itself. And we want you to understand that it's not going to happen overnight. It is a progress. It is a process. And we've tried to outline those progressions of what you can do at each level to become a more experienced and more proficient um, athlete. So hopefully this process has led you, you know, a little bit further down the line of knowing more about what US Paralympic swimming is doing to um, develop our movement, develop our coaches and develop our athletes so that we can support the higher levels of para swimming at at our best. So I personally want to thank you for participating today. I think it's always helpful to share this information with more audiences and more groups that have potential to come into our pipeline. So I really appreciate you taking the time to take a look at the basics of how we can help and develop the sport of para swimming 
um, towards Tokyo and beyond. So thank you for joining us. And I believe this is a Q&A time. Um, so I'm gonna turn that over to, I believe, Julie to help us navigate. Yeah, thanks so much, Peggy. That's such a lot of great information. Um, we do have a few questions and also would encourage our audience to interact with the session via social using the hashtag MoveUnited. Uh, so lots and lots of questions around how to get involved in the emerging clinics and the Can-Am um, events that were mentioned on this call and whether there's a web page or, or how people can find out more about participating in those events that you've talked about. The U.S. Paralympic website we put up on that last slide. So that that is the first um, website to view. All current events are typically loaded onto there as they come. Of course, this year, most everything has been postponed um, or rescheduled or is going virtual. So hopefully, um, if you get into the habit of checking that regularly, you'll see how, you know, what events are being offered and when they're offered. Along with that, there'll be a link to a potential meet packet that would have camp or clinic information incorporated into that if there is going to be an emerging level. Um, Nathan and Aaron, do you wanna interject here a little bit more about um, what's on the horizon for those? I've unmuted you, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so as Peggy said, we uh, post all of our camp, clinic, as well as competition information on our website. Nathan is posting those web links uh, in the chat feature. So please visit our website. Um, we do keep those regularly updated uh, with the current information. So especially in today's changing climate, um, we are marking them as a lot of them as postponed, unfortunately. Um, and we'll reannounce dates as soon as um, clubs and, and programs can get back up and running. So if you are interested in having us um, look at your program to host an event, please reach out to us, um, the uspara.swiminfo at usopc.org, which is in the chat. Um, we can definitely get in contact with you about setting up future programs. Great, thank you. Um, we've had some questions around um, connected to classification as well as coaches who want to get more involved. Um, I get this question a lot. If you're a coach in a swim club and you have an athlete with a disability um, come into your program and you want to get a little bit of guidance that's unique to that athlete, um, where do you start? So really at that gra grassroots getting involved level, um, how do you get more information? I would suggest attending an intro clinic, um, coming to a coaches only workshop, um, definitely reaching out um, to any one of the three of us um, can help direct that. But the, the goal is to get coaches involved and to help them. So these clinics and workshop opportunities are a perfect way to do that. We will be developing those in an online format that will allow them to access that information. And that was planned for 2021. Um, we're gonna try and roll some of that into 2020 and have some of the introduction clinic information up and the coaches workshop. Of course, on site, you know, face-to-face -face participation, you know, in person is always better. Um, to, to facilitate that, but obviously we can't get out to all clubs or, or, or coaches, but attending those types of experiences definitely help a coach get more involved and more knowledge behind them. But I also recommend reading every single, go to every single link on our website and just read everything that's available because it's amazing the amount of information you can have uh, you, you have access to just by, you know, really becoming knowledgeable what's posted already on the website. For sure. And I think it's also good to remind coaches that you are a coach first and foremost, and that apply the same skills you have as a coach to anyone, regardless of a disability or otherwise. Definitely. Yeah. 
Um, and this might be a question for you, Erin, around classification. We've had some folks ask about getting involved to become a classifier and how they might um, do that. Yeah, so um, once again, I'll, I'll keep, we'll keep directing you back to the, the Greater U.S. Paralympics website um, for classification material. However, um, the biggest things are making sure that you have the eligible credentials um, to qualify for class, to be a classifier. Um, in, on the medical side, it, it does vary a little bit, but it is primarily physical therapists and medical doctors. Um, that are eligible, as well as on the technical side, it can be a rec therapist, a coach, anybody with that sporting um, expertise. And so we do offer national classification courses. Um, we try to offer at least one per year in swimming. Obviously, this year's uh, thrown a wrench into it. Um, and really just reaching out, uh, Kyle Knott, K-N-O-T-T -T, is our current um, classification manager at U.S. Paralympics, and he can further direct you. But classification, I know it's this big, big uh, item that everybody talks about, but the biggest thing is, one, we want to get kids involved in the sport, um, and classification can come later, especially when we see a lot of these young kids that we're super excited to have involved in the sport. Um, really, it's just basic learning the techniques and the basics of swimming first and foremost. Classification can come later as that athlete starts to progress and move through the pipeline. But until then, you know, get them, get them active, get them involved in swimming. I know it can be a little bit frustrating in the beginning trying to figure out what a child may have in terms of their ability as opposed to their disability. And so we really just want kids to find, find their love and passion for the sport of swimming and then uh, for those coaches to really figure out what all of that athlete can do in the water, because oftentimes it looks a lot different than a track and field athlete um, due to the mode of in which they have to compete, whether it's using you know the track chairs or or prosthetic. So we're really just trying to figure out what that athlete can do and has the potential to do. So anybody interested in classification, um, please reach out to us um, and we'll post Kyle's contact information in the chat as well. Great, thank you. And I think you you answered my question as well, or some folks were asking about getting kids involved and that sometimes they get frustrated early on um, and how to, what, what should coaches really focus on um, for kids and getting them engaged in para swimming and excited about it. Are there any great like videos or resources of those online as well um, that you could recommend? Um, I'll defer to the coaches, Nathan and Peggy, um, for that one. <laughs> well, we're, you know, Nathan, jump in as well. We're developing some videos for coaches to facilitate the help uh, with their para athletes. Again, I think it's, if you have a coach with a, a para athlete in their program is trying to start from the same biomechanical um, development model for each stroke and then adjusting it and not being afraid to trial and air things out for that athlete and discover what might work specifically for them to gain um, forward movement in the water, balance in the water, and just being creative. Don't be afraid to run into a toolbox of all kinds of different things we improvise all the time. Like, okay, if I want your legs to be floated, but you're a spinal cord injury, I might strap a buoy on your legs for a little while to get your body up into a position to initiate the upper body movement pattern that we want to see. So it's, it's being creative and coming out of the box a little bit and using just what you might have around the pool. Um, but a lot of that comes from trial and error and being willing to fail at some of those attempts um, and go back to the drawing board. It's, it, it's being creative and I guess trying to figure out what the athlete can do in the water, but come from the same foundational um, stroke uh, mechanical format, technical format and then just make the adjustments with what they have to do, have to work with. So Thanks, be cool. creative. 
That's that's great advice. And we are we are getting kicked out of our session. We're running up on our next um, session today. We hope everybody in the audience will join us for navigating nutrition for high performance up next. We're excited about that, but really want to thank um, Peggy, Erin and Nathan for sharing their hours with us today and the time um, for the session and really um, has been really informative. So thank you and uh, continue to encourage the audience to stay engaged on social hashtag move united. But thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. All right, we have stopped live stream. And then all I'll do is jump off and end this meeting now for everyone else. But thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you.